Chapter one. Y'all gonna like this. I should have been in school that April day, but instead I was up on the ridge near the old spar mine above our farm, whipping the gray trunk of a rock maple with a dead stick and hating Edward Thatcher. During recess, he'd pointed at my clothes and made sport of them. Instead of tying into him, I'd turn tail and run off. When Miss Malcolm rang the bell to call us back inside, I was halfway home. Picking up a stone, I threw it into some bracken ferns hard as I could. Someday, that was how hard I was going to light into Edward Thatcher, make him bleed like a stuck pig. I'd kick him from one end of Vermont to the other, sorry him good. I'd teach him not to make fun of shaker ways. He'd never show his face in the town of learning Vermont ever again. No, sir. Let's stop there. So it starts off with our character skipping school. He left school. Okay. Why did he leave school? Because of being bored. He was being bullied. That's exactly right. Specifically, what was he being, being bullied about? Go to Bradley. His clothing. He said he, Edward Thatcher had pointed at his clothes and made sport of them, meaning making fun of them. Now look. This writer, Robert Newton Peck, this is what he does so well. He writes about things that we can all identify with. Okay, We have all had a time in our life, every one of us, Okay, we've all had a time in our life where we didn't feel good about something because somebody said something to us or about us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you didn't have your clothes made fun of, but you've been made fun of sometime in your life. Oh my God. <laughs> Jeez Louise, Bradley. For those watching, Bradley is a special boy. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so look, that's, but that's what he does so well. All right, there are going to be parts of this book that we've never experienced before, but a good writer, if you, if they're, what they can do is they can have small things in their story that everybody can identify with, and being teased is one of them. And also, we've all been at a time where we were teased so bad, we wanted to get away from the person who was doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it hurt our feelings. Like, we just want to go to another room or leave school. So even though we didn't necessarily leave school, we've all had a minute, you know, a moment where we're like, my God, it's I hate this kid. I want to get away from him. So that's what, that's, what, that's what our main character is experiencing here. Let us continue. A painful noise made me whip my head around and jump at the same time. When I saw her, I knew she's in trouble. It was the big Holstein cow, one of many, that belonged to our near neighbor, Mr. Tanner. This one he called Apron because she's mostly black except for the white along her belly, which went up her front and around her neck like a big, clean apron. She was his biggest cow. Mr. Tanner told Papa, and his best milker. And he is fixing to take her up to Rutland Fair come summer. As I ran toward her, she made a dreadful noise again. I got close up, saw why. Her big body was pumping up and down, trying to have her calf. She fell down, there was blood on her foreleg, and her mouth was all thick, foamy with yellow green spit. I tried to Reached my hand out and pat her head, but she was wild-eyed mean, making this breezy noise almost every breath. Turning away from me, she showed me her swollen rump. Her tail was up, arched high, whipping through the air with every heave of her back. Sticking out of her was the head and one hoof of her calf. His head was so covered with blood and burst sock that I had no way telling he's alive or dead until I heard him bawl. So he's, as he's skipping school or going home from school, he sees Mr. Tanner's cow. And what is the cow doing? The, the cow is giving birth. And she has a head and a hoof sticking out of her. Girls, this is Mr. Richmond's moment to tell you to never get pregnant. Do you want a head and hoof sticking, sticking out of you? <laughs> Look at these boys. I mean, come on, you don't want that. Now, now. She said, and he says, I didn't know if this cow was alive or dead until I heard him, the, the calf, until I heard him bawl. What does bawl mean? Yeah, like, like that, right? Here we go. April went crashing through the pucker bush, me right behind. I'd never caught up, but because she had to stop and strain, I got to the calf's head, got a purchase on him. He was so covered with slime and apron was so wandering, there's no holding to it. Besides, being just 12 years old, I weighed a bit over 100 pounds. Apron was comfortable over a thousand, and it wasn't much of a tug for her. As I went down, losing my grip on the calf's neck, 
Her hoof caught my shin bone and it really smarted. Only thing that made me get up and give the whole idea another go was when he bawled again. I just wound up running away from Edward Thatcher, running away from the schoolhouse, eyes feathered if I was going to run away from one darn more thing. I needed a rope, but there wasn't any, so I had to make one. It didn't have to be long, just strong. Chasing old Wakeman through the next pack of prickers. Sure took some fun out the whole business. I made my mistake of trying to take my trousers off as I ran. No good. So I sat down in the prickers, yanked them off over my boots, caught up to apron. After a few bad tries, I got one pant leg around the calf's head, knotted it snug. Calf! I said to him, you stay up your mall's high inside, you're about to choke. Might as well choke getting yourself born. Whatever old apron decided I was doing to her back yonder, she did not take kindly to it. So she started off again with me in the rear, hanging on the way Christmas. I'm on bare butt and privates, catching a thorn with every step. That calf never coming one inch closer to coming out. When apron stopped to heave again, I got the other pant leg around a dogwood tree that was about as thick as a fence post. Now, only three things could happen. My trousers would rip, apron would just uproot the tree or the calf would slide out. But nothing happened. Apron just stood, shaking, heaving, straining, never moved forward a step. I didn't know what to do next. Her calf bawled once more, making a weaker noise than before. But all Apron did was heave in that one place. Now let's stop there. When it says the calf bawled once more, making a weaker noise than before, what does that mean? It's dying, it's choking, it's running out of oxygen, right? Yo, cow! I yelled at her, grabbing a dead blackberry cane along as a bull whip and big rounds of broom handle. You move that big smelly behind, you hear me? I never hit anybody, boy or beast, as I hit that cow. I beat her so hard, I was crying. Where I held the big cane, the thorns were chewing up my hands real, real bad. But it only got me madder. I kicked her. Stoned her, kicked her again one last time. So hard and utter, I thought I heard her grunt. Both her hindquarters sort of hunkered down in the brush. Then she started forward. My trousers went tight. I heard a rip and a calf ball and a big hunk of hot stinking stuff went all over me. Some of it was calf, some of it wasn't. As I went down under the force and weight of it, I figured something either got dead or got born. All I knew is I was snarled up in a passel of wet stuff. There was a strong cord holding me against something was very hot and kicked a lot. What is this cord he's talking about? An umbilical cord, I'm assuming. I brushed some of the slop away from my eyes and looked up, and there was Apron. Her big black head and her big black mouth licking first me and then her calf. She was far from whole. Her mouth was open. She was gasping for air. She stumbled once. I thought for sure I was going to wind up underneath a very big cow. The noise in her throat came at me again. Her tongue lashed to and fro like the tail of a clock. Looked to me as if there was something in her mouth. She'd start to breathe and then, like a cork in a bottle, some darn thing in there would cut it off. Her big body swayed like she was dizzy or sick. As the front of her fell to her knees, her head hit my chest as I lay on the ground. Her nose almost touching my chin. She had stopped breathing. Her jaw was locked open, so I put my hand into her mouth, but felt only her swollen tongue. Stretched my fingers up into her throat, and there it was, a hard ball about apple size. It was stuck in her windpipe or her gully. I didn't know which, and I didn't care, so I shut my eyes, grabbed it, and yanked. Somebody told me once that a cow won't bite. That somebody is as wrong as sin on Sunday. I thought my arm got sawed off partway between elbow and shoulder. She bit and bit and never let go. She got to her feet and kept on biting. That devil cow ran down off that ridge, my arm in her mouth, dragging me half nigga with her. What she didn't do to me with her teeth, she did with her front hoofs. It should have been broad daylight, but it was night, black night as black and as bloody and as bad as getting hurt again and again could ever be. It just went on and on. It didn't quit. And that's the end of chapter one. Let's talk about this. 
when he says it should have been broad daylight, but it was night, black night. Why is it why is it night if it should be broad daylight? Maybe he's like Good guess, but no. To, to people watching, Bradley said maybe he's looking at the cow. No. How about you? Do you have an idea? Can't hear you. Somebody else? Come on. He said it should have been daylight, but it was night, black night. That's right. He got knocked out. Yeah, good job, Garrett. There you go. All right. Ugh. Chapter 2 or reader manual? Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> Huh? Nothing. Okay. Um, somebody tell me the time for real. Uh, it was 10, 13. 10, 13. 10, 13. 10, 13. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah. All right, chapter two. Haven Peck. Somebody was yelling out Papa's name, but I couldn't see anything. And it was real strange because my eyes were open. They sort of sting, so I blinked, but the fog was still there. There was a wool blanket around me. I could feel the wool rub against the raw place on my arm. But the hurt of it seemed to keep me awake, keep me alive. There were three voices now. Excuse me. There were more voices now. I heard Papa answer the man who was carrying me. And the man said, is this your boy? There's so much blood and dirt and Satan on him. I can't tell for sure. Besides, he's near naked. Yep, said Papa. That's our Robert. Then I heard Mama's voice, soft and sweet like music. And I could feel her hands on my head and my hair. Aunt Carrie was there too. She was Mama's oldest sister who lived with us. Strong hands were touching my legs now and then my ribs. I tried to say something about not being in school. Somebody had some warm water and washed my face with it. The water had lilac in it and smelled right restful. We're beholden to you, Benjamin Tanner, said Papa, for fetching him home. Whatever he done, I'll make it right. <clears throat> Better look to his arm. Got tore up worse than proper. Maybe broke. Haven, I heard Mama say, the boy's holding something in his hand. Can't make it out. I felt them taking something from my hand. I didn't want to render it up, but they took it. I never see the like of it, Mama said, like it's near to be alive. I could hear Mr. Tanner's rough voice over the others. I know what that is. It's a goiter. Goiter? Where'd he get it? It's an evil thing, but for now, let's tend his arm. Mr. Tanner, we may got to cut away part of your blanket. Ain't mine, belongs to my horse, so cut all your mind to. I felt Papa pulling the blanket down off my shoulder until it got caught in the clotted blood. I heard his jackknife click open and cut away part of the wool. Let's stop there. So our, our main character, protagonist, Robert, was pretty beat up from the cow, right? So when Mr. Tanner found him, he wrapped him in a wool blanket. Does that sound like a smart idea? Mm -hmm. Of course it sounds gross because it was his horse's blanket. Kind of germy. <laughs> Second... Y'all know wool is kind of like thready, you know? Could you imagine like when the when your wound, when the blood congealed, you know, scabbed, and it gets stuck in there without like how much? Y'all ever had to take a scab? I remember one time I, I had a scab on my knee, and I was running, and I fell, and I pulled the scab, and it pulled the scab off. It was a relative, and it hurt, man. It hurt a lot worse than cutting my knee. So anyway, I think taking this scab off with the blanket would hurt worse than originally getting cut, you know what I'm saying? Let's keep going. Goiter, goiter, belongs to my horse. Here we go. I tied my bandana on his arm, said Mr. Tanner, so he wouldn't bleed dry. When Papa loosened it up, Mr. Tanner said, he'll bleed again with a loose haven. He will, said Papa. That'd be a good thing for his arm. Let it open up, holler out all the dirt. Only way to treat a wound is bleed it till it's clean as a cat's mouth. True. Lucy, Papa spoke soft to Mama. Better get a needle threaded. He'll want sewing. Well, let's stop there. Raise your hand if you've had stitches. Is your mother a nurse or doctor? No. Raise your hand if you went to the doctor to get the stitches done. Yeah, I would think that's what most of us would do unless our parents were like some medical professional, right? 
not these old country folk. The mama's going to get some thread, a needle, and sew this kid up herself. So think of what kind. Does that sound like wealthy people? No. Getting made, up, made fun of for your clothes. Your mama's got to stitch you up. They don't sound particularly well to do, do they? Let's keep going. He picked me up in his arms, carried me into the house, into the kitchen. He lay me flat on the long lamas table, face up. Mama put something soft under my head, and Aunt Carrie kept washing me off with lilac water while Papa cut off my shirt and took off my boots. Poor lamb, said Mama. Somebody put a hand on my forehead to see if I was cool. It was followed by a cold, wet cloth, and it felt real good. Funny, but it was the only thing on my entire body that I could feel. Then I felt the first of Mama's stitches going into the meat of my arm. I wanted to yell out, but I didn't have the will for it. Instead, I just lay there on my back on that old kitchen table and let Mama sew me back together. It hurt. My eyes filled with crying, and the water ran in rivers to my ears, but I never let out a whimper. When I took all the sewing to be took, by this time it must have been more thread than boy, Papa burdened me upstairs to my room. I could smell Mama, crisp, starched, plump in my pillar, and the cool muslin pillowcase touched both my ears as the back of my head sank into all those feathers. Tell Mr. Tanner, I said. Mama rushed where my head was. Papa and Aunt Carrie were at Bedfoot. Tell Mr. Tanner. I said again, that were he to look up on the ridge, he'll find a calf. I helped get it born. Afterward, old Apron was still choking, so I had to rip the ball out of her throat, and I didn't mean to skip school. I'll be, said Papa. Where are your trousers, Robert? Said Aunt Carrie, who took quite a stock in appearances. Up on the ridge. When I tied them around the tree, they got busted some. I'm sorry, Mama, you just have to cut me out another pair. Mama put her face right down close to mine, and I could smell her goodness. I'm preference to men busted pants than a busted boy. I, I can't feel anything in my right hand. That's because it's resting, said Mama. It wants to get well, and so do you. So right about now, your pa and Aunt Carrie and I are going to tiptoe out of here, let you get some rest. You earned it. They left, and I closed my eyes and went right off. Later, I woke up when Mama brought me a dish of hot succotash and a warm glass of milk and fresh from the evening pail. The bubbles were still on it. That's real good, I said. At bedtime, Papa came upstairs with his big shoes, kicking one of the risers, brought me one of the last of the winter apples from the cellar. He pulled up a chair close to my bed and looked at me for a long time while I ate the apple with my left hand. You mending? Yes, Papa. I ought to lick you proper for leaving the schoolhouse. Yes, Papa, you ought. Someday you want to walk into the bank and learn and write down your name, don't you? Yes, sir. Let's stop there. When his dad says, I ought to lick you proper for leaving the schoolhouse. What's that mean? <laughs> yeah, every time, you know, you get, you know, a lick. That's three licks, right? Y'all ever gotten some licks before? Yes. yes. I don't cotton to raise a fool. No, Papa. I tried to move my right arm, but it made me wince up. I couldn't help but make a noise about it. She bit you up fair, that cow. Clear the bone. Sure did. I always thought cows don't bite. Anything will bite, be it provoked. I guess I provoked old apron. Boy, she sure did some provoking on me. You put a hand in her mouth? <clears throat> yes, sir. You rip out that garter? Yes, sir. Was that for or after the calfing? I just remember. All I recall is that April was choking something fearful with a piece of stuff in her throat. She wanted me to fetch it out. So you tore out that garter? Yes, sir. Her, half was, her calf was hung up, too. So I tore him out, tore my pants, tore myself. Between me and the calf and apron, we tore up a good part of Vermont, as well as each other. How you feel? Like if I die, at least I'll stop hurting. Bet you don't complain. Boy who skipped school don't get no stick put on him. No, sir, I won't complain. Except when I move it sharp and sudden, my arm is real numb. 
It's the rest of me that's in misery. Where? My backside? My privates? I'm sucked so full of prickers it makes me smart just to think on it. Every damn what die here? Every darn pricker in Vermont must be working there, must be in me, working their way through, coming out the yonder side. It's enough to sell your soul. Well, if your soul looks as poorly as your carcass, I don't guess it'll bring much. I don't guess it will. Papa fished around in his pocket. Here's two beads of spruce gum. One's for me. I don't mention you'd want one. Yes, sir. I sure would. Please. Here then. Might help you forget where those prickers are nested. Helping already. Thank you, Papa. The spruce gum was hard and grainy at first. Then the heat of your mouth begins to melt it down so that it's worth the chewing. The bit that Papa gave me was rich, full of sappy juices, except that every so often you have to spat out a flick of the bark. I saw a sumac today, boy. Is it ripe yet? Out of his pocket, Papa pulled a twig of sumac that was finger thick, four inch long. How's that look? Papa, that looks real good. You got your knife? Papa cracked out his knife and ringed the bark, set a good notch at one end. All that was left to do now was to bucket soak it overnight, just enough to slip the bark sleeve and boil it to kill the poison. That'll be some whistle, Robert. Sure will. A boy with a whistle as fine as this won't have no earthly reason to skip school. You have a mind to agree. I agree, Papa. Now this next part is very important. You listen closely, okay? You got about a half page to go, but this is the most important part of the story, or of the chapter. He stood up big and tall with his head not quite bumping the roof of my bedroom. Don't be going to sleep with spruce gum in your mouth. I won't, Papa. He bent down, pulled the crazy quilt up around my throat. I could tell by the smell of his hand that he'd killed pigs today. There was a strong smell to it, like stale death. That smell was almost always on him, morning and night, until Saturday, when he'd strip down to the white and stand in the kitchen wash tub, up to his shins in hot soapy water, and wash himself clean of the pigs in the killing. He smelled the best on Sunday morning, when I sat next to him at shaker meeting. He smelled just like the big brown bar of soap that he used. Sometimes there was some store-bought pomade on his hair. But when you kill pigs for a living, you can't always smell like Sunday morning. You just smell like hard work. And that's the end of the second chapter now. What's he do for a living? Yeah, he's a butcher. He slaughters pigs, right? I mean, bacon, we can't just, you know, cut off a piece of the pig and eat it. We got to have somebody that does that for a living, right? So it's very important for y'all to remember that this man, that his dad, whose name is Haven, by the way, Haven Peck, and he, that's his real name. In real life, the man's name was Haven. Do y'all know what Haven means? Haven? The word Haven, H-A-V-E-N. Like what? Like What'd you say? I said a paradise. A, a paradise? I don't know. You're on, well, I, I, apparently you don't. Why do you always doubt yourself so much? It means protector. A haven is a protector. Anyway, so it's very important for y'all to remember that he um, that he is a pig slaughterer. That's what he does for a living. Now, also, um, it says he always smells like pigs, except one day of the week. Which day of the week is that? Sunday. Huh? Sunday. Sunday. For what? Church. Church. That's right. Now, that doesn't mean that the other days of the week he doesn't bathe. But I'm going to explain something to y'all, something you guys can identify with. All of you, well, or at least most of you, but probably all of you, have done one of the following things. You've either cleaned an animal, cleaned a fish, peeled a shrimp, a boiled shrimp, or peeled boiled crawfish, right? You know how you get that smell on your hand and you can wash your hand like 10 times but you can't get it off? It'll be gone like the next day, you know what I'm saying? So it's not that he's dirty, but it's Sunday is the only day that he doesn't work, right? So it's the only day that he doesn't smell like hard work, right? That's important to remember. We'll read some more later this week. Any questions, comments, expostulations? I like the book. I'm glad you do. It's a great book. You're going to love it. Okay.